lecture can be perceived and used. Therefore, before we start our study, we are going to take our normal few moments of silence, which of course is designed to give every believer priest both privacy and the opportunity to make all those decisions necessary for a proper study. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again, from your perfect faithfulness, you've recognized our every need and our capacities. And in fulfillment of the plan that you've provided for us, you've given us yet another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. And then, as a result of its application, to develop capacity for life, for love, for happiness, for blessing, and capacity for service, and to handle those pro problems and pressures that you know are in our immediate future. We ask now that God the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us concentration, self-discipline, genuine humility, and anything else we might need for a proper study. As always, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Right, back to the introduction of the Old Testament. This is our last class of the year. So <laughs> the year's gone by quickly. And believe it or not, we've been in the Old Testament now for almost a year. We started in February. So <laughs> it doesn't seem like it, but, but we have. <clears throat> of course, maybe it does seem like it. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> We went over the structure and collection, talked about canonicity, uh, studying the keys to studying it. We went to, uh, compared to the division of time, where we reviewed uh, dispensations and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, different uh, uh, dispensations, what they consisted of, when they started, when they stopped. And then we got an overview of the books of the law, the entire Pentateuch. And then in point six, we started into the book of Genesis. In point A, we saw the fact that it was the longest period of history, obviously, since it includes that time period of Adam and Eve, which we have no idea how long that was, right? And then we have the three popular outlines that we looked at. <clears throat> Each of those outlines gave us from a different viewpoint. We talked a little bit about the authorship and the argumentation that's going on uh, now, <clears throat> argumentation, arguments are the arguments that are going on now uh, uh, in, in academia about who the author really are, is, but it, it tells us directly that it's Moses. We got a little bit of ancient Near East background with Gilgamesh and the flood. Uh, and then we're actually in point E right now, which is the uh, <clears throat> literary analysis. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, structure and the genre of the book. Uh, and then we are in sub point E, uh, point six, sub point E. Subpoint three, we're in the theological message of the book. We've seen uh, the chapters one through 11 and the content of that, the fact that there's a little creation that's actually covered, the fact that it was created from nothing and that God is patient and faithful. Uh, we saw advancing sin and punishment, so we saw the cycles, and I gave you a little bit of, uh, showed you a little bit of a table associated with uh, uh, the sin and punishment, and the fact that God is patient, just, and loving. Uh, then we saw some creation slash restoration versus the flood and how the, they uh, had a little bit of parallelism there. And we ended with the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> then we got into Gen Genesis chapter 12 through 36 and 38. We saw that God revealed the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, we saw how Abraham leaves Haran and his faith wavers. Uh, then he, his reaction to God's promises. We went through the fact that uh, Abram trusts God and divided the land with Lot. Uh, so once again, he was back in fellowship and trusting. So we have these periods of doubt, periods of trust, periods of doubt, and periods of trust. Okay, we saw how Abraham tried to help God along the way uh, with uh, uh, providing children. God continued <clears throat> to uh, uh, promise, keep up, keep up his promise with Abraham. And we saw Isaac as the divine gift. Uh, in chapters 24 through 26, we saw Isaac and Esau. And then we saw Jacob in the 12 tribes, and that's where we ended last night, I mean last night, last week, and uh, we're ready to pick up with subpoint 10. A relatively quick review. So we're in pan 10 with two parents through it. All right, through it. Two parents around it. <laughs> okay. The account. So point 10 starts off. The account of Abraham. And the other patriarchs illustrates for us how God works out his promises
in spite of obstacles, or if you've seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, it's obstacles. Anyway, <laughs> in spite of obstacles and threats to their fulfillment, in order to demonstrate that they are divine gifts. Okay, so it says, the account of Abraham and the other patriarchs illustrates for us how God works out his promises in spite of obstacles and threats to their fulfillment in order to demonstrate that they are divine gifts. So one of the things we have to always realize is that God's going to give promises and he's going to keep those promises. Uh, and some of them are conditional and some of them are unconditional. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. Uh, promise. Abraham uh, did not have to function properly uh, for the, for the uh, covenant to stay intact, okay? And that's what we saw through that section of Genesis. We have, however, uh, uh, promises for us that uh, sometimes are conditional. If you do this, God will do that, okay? Uh, we also have the unconditional one of salvation, right? We, we accept Christ as Savior. I guess it is conditional from that perspective, but once we're saved, we're always saved. Right? And so even though we malfunction, we still have salvation. That is still a promise that we are going to be able to uh, uh, stand on and be able to keep. Okay? Continue the point. Through this part of Genesis, comma, the main theological point is that God, comma, true to his essence, comma, is omniscient, omnipotent, Voracious, that's V-E-R-A-C-I-O-U-S. Voracious meaning truthful. He is truth, okay? He told the truth. He said that uh, Abraham's uh, progeny were going to be uh, many, and of course they are, right? So he is truthful, okay, as opposed to voracious, which is a different word, okay? Omniscient, omnipotent, voracious, righteous, and just, Period. So right off in the first book, we can start getting the, some of the very <coughs> key co components of the essence of God. Okay, Continue the point. The key is the Abrahamic covenant which in turn gives us confidence in the new covenant slant contract to the church, period. God does and will fulfill all of his promises, period.
So the center chunk focuses on focuses primarily on the Abrahamic covenant and the continued uh, the continued repeat of the Abrahamic covenant through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, coming down and continuing to repeat the fact that uh, they are going to get all of the things that God stipulated in the Abrahamic covenant, and despite the fact that they have malfunctioned. Okay, uh, they're going to continue to get it. We, we uh, see in, in chapter 38 that uh, Judah's sins are brought out and, he is, and he, uh, his information is, is brought forward as to how he's malfunctioned. And even with that, he still is part of the Abrahamic covenant. So we see that uh, God is just, he's righteous, and he still uh, maintains his integrity throughout the process. Okay, now we're ready to go into subpoint little c. Oh, there's the family tree. <clears throat> so 6E, subpoint 3, subpoint little c. The Joseph account. Or why is so large of a section? So the Joseph account, or why, is so large of a section of Genesis... comma, i.e. chapters 37 and 39 through 48 or almost one-fourth of the book devoted to Joseph. Question mark. So point one. And we're right back at one with two parents around it. So these first couple sub points are going to answer that question. Sub point one. He, now we're talking about Joseph, he was the link. between the family of Israel and the nation of Israel, period. Up to the time of Joseph, Got it. <laughs> Up to the time of Joseph, the Israelites were a family, period. Joseph was connected. with the Egyptian sojourn and ultimately the birth of the Jewish nation, period. Now, remember, he's not considered the father of the Jewish nation. That goes to Moses. Uh, Moses is considered to be the father of the Jewish nation. Moses brings them out of Egypt, okay, and uh, leads them, of course, to the uh, promised land. Doesn't take them into the promised land, okay, but it's during Moses' uh, uh, exodus, as we know, that uh, we end up having the, uh, the laws established that are set for the nation as opposed to just for the family. Uh, it is through Moses that the tribes get certain pieces of land, okay, as, as set up. 
And so uh, it is through Moses as the father of the, uh, well, he doesn't set up the lands, but that ends up being uh, uh, Joshua as they go into the promised land. But the idea is that it's uh, Moses who's bringing them out and, and, and uh, at, during that time period that they actually form a nation. Uh, remember, they wander around for 40 years in the desert to, uh, one, get rid of those individuals who malfunctioned uh, and had to die off without ever seeing the promised land, and two, get them ready to be able to be a nation, to be able to take in, to, to cross over and go into the promised land. Because uh, remember, one of the first things that happens is they have to end up fighting uh, all kinds of other nations and things like that in order for them to uh, get the land that they ultimately uh, end up inheriting uh, <clears throat> for the time period. Okay, so, but it's through Joseph that uh, we have the line of Moses, okay? So, <clears throat> I take that back, disregard that. But it's through Joseph that we end up having the nation being formed, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Subpoint uh, two. He is the Bible's. Most complete, quote, type, end quote, of Christ, semicolon. Now, the word type, when we talk about the word type, it has a specific meaning in theology and, and uh, uh, other scientific branches, but the idea being that the word type means the, the mold, if you will, the, uh, the uh, uh, form. Uh, in software, well, anyway, I won't get into that, but it's the, it's the, it's the, it's like when you talk about the archetype or whatever, you know, it's, it's the highest form, it's the, it's the uh, uh, mold that forms it. So by being a type of something, you are showing and representing uh, that the, the uh, uh, thing that will come from that type. I hope that makes sense. I'm not explaining it very well, but I, I hope you understand. So, so basically, Joseph as being the type means that he represents and shows what Christ is going to be, okay, by being the type uh, of, of Christ, okay? So he's the Bible's most complete type of Christ, semicolon. Not that he was flawless, Comma, but his faults were not recorded, period. Compare this to chapter 38. In which the faults and the shame of Judah are recounted in detail, period. So it's interesting in the structure, and we won't get too much into the structure, but it's interesting in the structure that, that you have verse 38, okay, where, the, well, start off, in 37, Joseph is introduced. Okay, but then there's a there's a like a parenthetical insertion in verse in, in chapter 38. That's all of chapter 38. That's how bad Judah was and all of the sins that Judah committed and the things that Judah did. Okay, and then you go back to 39 and you pick back up again with Joseph, right? And you go into all of the the good things that Joseph does. And so there's a very good uh, a way that it's set up to give you the, the antithesis in 38 of what Joseph really is by looking at Judah, right? And then you come back to Joseph, and then, you're, then and the rest of the, the story is through uh, uh, from 39 on, okay? So uh, <clears throat> Joseph, uh, he had faults, but they're not brought out, <laughs> okay? Whereas Judah's were, okay? Point number three. Numerous parallels between the life of Joseph and that of Jesus
may be seen in this account. Although it is never actually stated biblically, that he is such a type, period. See, the Bible doesn't ever come out and say, okay, Joseph is going to represent the Messiah, <laughs> okay, and what the Messiah is going to be like. Or Joseph is going to have the same types of qualities that the Messiah has. The Bible never really comes out and, and states that, that clearly. But what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to uh, study the scriptures and you're supposed to understand uh, Joseph and you're supposed to understand how Joseph functioned and, and the things that he did, okay, and these parallels that I'm going to give you and, and realize, ah, okay, now when I, see, when I see the Lord, when I see the Messiah, I see that he was represented through Joseph and even as far back as the book of Genesis, the Jews were getting an idea of what the Messiah was really going to be like. See, that's why, <clears throat> that's why it's such a shock to us as Christians, when you go and you look at it and you say, why in the world didn't the Jews recognize Christ as the Messiah? I mean, he fulfilled everything that was in the Old Testament, right? Why didn't they see him, right? Why didn't they recognize him as the Messiah? And the fact of the matter is, is because they were so apostate that they were all wrapped up in themselves and they were so wrapped up in the, uh, the, uh, the forest, as they say, that you know, they were so uh, tight in the trees they couldn't see the whole forest, right? And so they never could see the forest through the trees. Okay, They never could see the Messiah because they didn't truly understand what it was that they had learned. Um, there was a fantastic uh, uh, Star Trek episode, old Star Trek episode, if you ever watched old Star Trek, where you have these two parties that are fighting amongst each other, right? Uh, these, these, uh, these two uh, uh, nations, basically, on this other planet that are fighting amongst each other, right? And, and through the process of the show, the, the uh, crew of the Enterprise, who is on one side, and they end up, you know, getting stuck in the middle of this whole thing, right? Who, uh, anyway, the crew of the Enterprise uh, suddenly realizes that what they're talking, in the terms that they're using, they're talking about the communists and the Yankees. Right? And these guys have these holy books, right, which they are quoting, <clears throat> but the pronunciation's all wrong, and it turns out what it is, is it's the, uh, it's the Constitution, right? <laughs> and, but, they don't, but, but they don't know what it is because it's been this holy book, right, you know, and they've passed it down through generation to generation, and the, and the, uh, the uh, pronunciation thing is wrong. And so what's happened is they've kept this book as if only the holy priests could read it. And Kurt has to finally tell them, no, this was for the entire people, right? <laughs> this, was, this was supposed to be for, you know, you guys don't even know what you're reading, right? <laughs> you know, then he, and he goes through and explains the words and the fact that it's for the people. Well, that's what happened to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They'd gotten to the point where they were so tied up in the rituals and so tied up in the, uh, the uh, actual uh, uh, Torah and making sure that they could actually pronounce it and write it and, and you know, take care of it, but they didn't understand what it was that they were looking at. And that's part of, you know, and they were apostate, and that was why they ended up not seeing the Messiah. But, the, you know, you were supposed to be able to look at Jesus and say, oh, you know, Wow, Joseph kind of went through all of that, and, and now we got you know Jesus, and, and uh, he's you know he's a promised person just like Joseph was. Okay, so sub point three says numerous parallels between the life of Joseph and that of Jesus may be seen in this account, although it is never actually stated biblically that he is such a type. Sub point four ex examples of the parallels include, and I have to excuse me, I have to. There was a Kleenex box here somewhere. Oh well. Okay. Include. Subpoint so little a, or a with single parents around it. Both were special objects of a father's love. Genesis 37.3 
compared with Matthew 3.17, John 3.35, and John 5.20, semicolon. Subpoint, little b, b with single parents around it. Both were hated and rejected by their, quote, brothers, end quote. Genesis 37, 4. Compared with John 15, 25. Semicolon. In both cases, The brothers conspired to slay them. Genesis thirty seven eighteen. Compared with Matthew twenty six. Three and four. So the brothers here in the in the New Testament accounts in John and Matthew, those are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We have Caiaphas, who's who is uh, planning on having uh, Christ killed. Okay, and originally they were going to uh, just flat out kill him, and then they realized they can't do that. <laughs> okay, uh, that's that's kind of against the law. So instead, we'll bend the law. We'll bend the law to make it work for us, and we'll have him crucified which, of course, was what was prophesied all along, that the Messiah was going to hang on a tree, right? And uh, so that was prophesied all along. And so uh, they un unknowingly uh, fulfilled the prophecy, uh, you know, by, by doing what they ended up doing. Okay, even goes to show you that God knew the, the, the in time, you know, eternity past exactly what these individuals, uh, even trying to be devious, were going to be able, you know, were going to do. And they fulfilled the prophecies, okay? Subpoint little D, D with single parents around it. In both cases, brothers conspired to slay them. Didn't I say C? I'm sorry. Subpoint B, both were hated and rejected by their brothers. Subpoint little C, in both cases, brothers conspired, the brothers conspired to slay them. Sorry about that. Subpoint little D, at the end of every <laughs> section of passages that I get here, there's a new point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Subpoint so little d. So if I don't say it, <laughs> I'll just give you the, the pattern. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Subpoint little, sorry about that. Subpoint little d. Joseph was intent, excuse me, was in intent and figure. Joseph was in intent and figure, meaning that he was Virtually, I guess maybe I should have been a better word. Put to death by his brothers, comma. And they thought they, you know, that it was the same as putting him to death, comma. <clears throat> as Christ actually was put to death. Genesis 37, 24. Compared with Matthew 27. Thirty five through thirty seven. Subpoint little E.
as Joseph reconciled his brothers. to himself and afterward exalted them, comma, so also at his second advent Christ will be reconciled to converted Israel. Of course, it will actually happen as we go into the millennium. Okay, Genesis 45. 1 through 15, semicolon. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10, semicolon. Hosea 2, 14 through 18. Compared with Romans 11, 1, 15, 25, and 26. Those are all in Romans 11. So Romans 11, 1, 15, 25, and 36. Period. Like I'm doing the lottery once in a while. <laughs> and the Powerball number is? Oh. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so those are reconciliation uh, uh, passages. Okay. Now back out, sub point five. This is five with two parents around it. The Joseph account, comma, though different in style, from that of the patriarchs, comma, So part of my intent here is I'm going through and, and I'm not delving into all of the style changes and things like that. Uh, we did talk uh, at the very beginning about how we would talk about style and things like that, and I will when extremely important. But I'm giving you, trying to give you enough information that on your own, as you go through these, you can go back and read it and say, ah, okay, I see that now. Okay, I give you enough information that you can study some of this on your own as well. Uh, <clears throat> which has helped me quite a bit studying this because now I can go back through it and do the same thing, right? I just get the opportunity to do it a little bit before you guys, that's all, okay? But uh, I have the same problems you do when we go through the Old Testament and you read some of these and you go, wow, this is like the same thing over and over again. God's mad, okay, I get it, right? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes to pick a book to go through, right? You know, it's, hey, let's go through this one, right? You know, and it's, it's, it, it, it's hard without actually digging in and studying it like we're doing right now. So when I say things like this, though, different style from that of the patriarchs, what you'll see is in that middle section, the literary style is different than when you get to the Joseph account because the Joseph account... A, doesn't do as much uh, bouncing back and forth and as much uh, genealogy as the, uh, that middle section does, because that middle section is telling you about how we get to Joseph, basically. So it had all of that genealogy in there. Okay? But, the, but the Joseph account is more of a prose in that it's more story-like. Uh, rather than just a historical, theological histo history, it's more a prose, and you go through it and you read it more like a story. That's why when you have uh, children's Bibles... 
those kinds of accounts are the ones that, uh, that they really, you know, are, are Bible stories. I shouldn't say children's Bibles. I should say Bible stories for children. There's books, right, Bible stories for children. You'll find those kinds of accounts are the ones that are pulled out because they're much more like prose, right? You'll find the story of Joseph in any uh, child's uh, Bible story book. Okay, uh, they tend to pick the, the the accounts that talk about a particular individual because it tends to be more prose-like. Okay, so the Joseph account, though different in style from that of the patriarchs, comma, also continues. The themes of the patriarchal narratives, colon. Primarily, God overcomes obstacles. To the fulfillment of his promises, period. In this case, comma, oh, I went blank, huh? Batteries died. One, two, three, I don't, I don't have a light up here. Still getting sound? Okay. Huh. Okay. <laughs> In this case, the family of God I already give you that? Okay. So God overcomes obstacles to the fulfillment of his promises, right? Okay. In this case, comma, the family of God is threatened by famine that could easily have brought All the promises to an end, comma. But God wonderfully preserved his people. Through miraculous means. Period. And if you know the story, Joseph is involved in that because he tells them how to save the grain, how to store it, and, uh, and how to make it through the famine. And uh, it is through uh, his brothers actually coming, and uh, they were running out of food, coming and asking for, uh, for food, right? And they don't recognize him. And uh, he uh, is, is gracious and actually gives them... <clears throat> You know, you know, gives them food to sustain, right? You know, and so this all plays in to uh, God's plan, of course, okay? Continue the point. Joseph himself gives us a theological means through which to view the events in his life, period. See, uh, when you read the story, it's pretty interesting. It's kind of written on at two levels. It's very, it's very good, particularly for what you would consider to be ancient writing, because you get the events that are happening, but you also get Joseph uh, coming through, and he has his mindset, and he has his understanding of God, and he has the reasons, and he, he gives us the reasons why he's doing certain things. And so that's the theological means. You can see Joseph's trust in God, unlike his predecessors, 
who uh, had these, uh, these ups and downs. The story of Joseph is his life has ups and downs, but his faith is always right on. Okay? He is always trusting God no matter what. As opposed to, you know, as we saw with Abraham, he was, you know, he, he couldn't trust God, uh, you know, for very long, and then he would, and then he wouldn't, and then he would, right? You know, well, God, you promised me uh, kids, but I don't have any yet, so I'm going to go, you know, uh, uh, try and impregnate this other woman here, and we'll have kids that way. We'll help you out, okay, right, you know, and, and things like that. Well, uh, uh, Joseph is right on all the way through and he gives us the explanation of how these things in his life are ha happening and what what uh, God has planned for him okay so Joseph himself gives us a theological means through which to view the events in his life period after his father's death of course you have the family tree there so you know it's uh, Jacob <laughs> After his father's death, his brothers worry. That Joseph will now take vengeance against them. Period. Remember, he had the means and opportunity to do that. At this point, uh, they were, you know, they were just coming out of the famine, and he was second to the pharaoh pri primarily, and uh, he could have, you know, he could have had them killed, right? So after his father's death, his brothers were worried that Joseph will now take vengeance against them. They approached him. Asking that he spare their lives. And his response indicates his awareness of God's plan in his life. Colon, quote, This is what he says, okay? So, <clears throat> colon, quote, Do not be afraid, comma, for, I, <clears throat> for am I in God's place? Question mark. So in other words, he's saying, I may be powerful, but I'm not God. Right, and I and I, it, it, what you did is between you and God. You you guys, uh, you know, we we have reconciled. Okay, I'm not going to kill you. Right? Do not be afraid. For am I in God's place? Question mark. As for you, comma. You meant evil against me. Comma. So as for you, you meant evil against me, comma, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about This present result, comma, to preserve, <coughs> to preserve many people alive, period, end quote. Genesis 50, 19 and 20. So see, he looks at it and he understands the plan of God. He looks at it and he says, yeah, you guys tried to kill me, but as a result, I ended up 
being in this, you know, being in <laughs> the Pharaoh's guy in charge of grain. And I ended up being able to save all of our people. So God turned something that would have been suffering circumstances, as we've, as we've studied in the past, to be a fantastic blessing for not only him, but all of the people of Israel. And he, and he understood that, right? So that's, that's how we see him presenting the, the uh, events in his life from a theological perspective, and how we see him as being an individual who is much more faithful than uh, some of his predecessors. Subpoint <clears throat> six. Six with double parents around it. God reveals himself in the life and account of Joseph to be a God in control of all the details of history, comma, once again showing the essence of God to man, period. From the perspective of the unbeliever or the immature believer, comma, it appears that Joseph. falls into, quote, bad luck, end quote, so from the perspective of the unbeliever or the immature believer, it appears that Joseph falls into bad luck as he moves from Palestine to Egypt and ultimately to prison, period. His life seems determined by those who seek to harm him. So when you read this, if you're an unbeliever or if you are an immature believer and you don't have the trust in God and you don't have the understanding that God is omniscient and God is omnipotent, uh, then you're going to look at it and say, boy, that guy sure had bad luck. Right? Sort of like reading the story of Job and going, boy, that guy had really bad luck. Right? <laughs> you, know? you, you read it and you say, uh, wow, all these things are happening. But what we find out instead uh, as a mature believer, when you go through it and you look at it from a theological perspective, what you understand is that God put all of these blocks in place. So once again, like Adam, who I mean, excuse me, like Abraham, who had to grow through all of the bad, bad choices he did, okay, Joseph grew from all of the things that were done to him, <laughs> okay, to where he got to the point that he ends up getting, as you, as I've pointed out in in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, family tree there, uh, is that he ends up getting a double blessing. Okay, the double blessing being that his two sons end up being two of the tribes, uh, of the 12 tribes, rather than just he, his, his family being one tribe. His family ends up being two of the tribes.
Okay, so my mic died. So if you can, if you missed the last couple parts, what we were saying is that the fact that uh, <clears throat> that Joseph functioned properly uh, and all of these things that happened to him happened to him so that he could grow and so that he could ultimately get to the point where he got double blessing, and his two uh, his two sons ended up becoming two of the tribes of the twelve tribes that go into uh, the the uh, promised land. Okay, so point six altogether says God reveals Himself in the life. An account of Joseph to be a God in control of all the details of history. Once again, showing the essence of God to man. From the perspective of the unbeliever or the immature believer, it appears that Joseph falls into, quote, bad luck, end quote, as he moves from Palestine to Egypt and ultimately to prison. His life seems determined by those who seek to harm him. Okay, continue the point. Joseph, however, is aware that God is the one behind the events in his life. So Joseph, however, is aware that God is the one behind the events in his life. This is the lesson that we are to learn. God is the one behind the events in our lives. Exclamation point. See, our volition determines the way events are going to go, but God has always, through the divine decree, understood exactly what we're going to do. And he's behind those events that happen. And uh, so, as we always say, you know, we, we have uh, individuals who who lose a loved one or whatever, and they're wondering, why am I still here? And the idea is, as long as you're alive, God's got a plan for your life, always. He isn't going to forget you. Oh, once they're married off, their pair, you know, and then I'm just going to let them go, and I'm going to forget about them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I only deal with single people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and if you lose, if you lose your, your uh, uh, significant other, Okay, if you lose your right man or right woman, uh, as it should be, uh, uh, and is designed for you to have a right man and right woman, okay, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have uh, some purpose in your life. Or as uh, in high school, I knew an individual whose whole family got killed except for him. Okay, uh, he still had purpose in his life. Okay. So, God is the one behind the events in our lives, and Joseph manifests this in spades. Subpoint seven, this is the last subpoint, and this is the last subpoint in point in uh, Genesis. Okay? Furthermore, comma, Joseph knows that God has overruled the evil intentions. of his brothers and others to raise him to a position within the government in order to bring about the salvation of his people and the continuation of the covenant promise. And I could do a whole, uh, a whole <laughs> class on uh, the fact that Joseph was raised up through the government to do this. 
particularly you know, when we look at our government. Right now, there are so many conservatives who are fearful for what happened. Okay, we had, we had an election that was not just. Okay, and uh, the potential of, you know, of, the, of a president, president-elect Biden's going to become president, uh, you know, whether we want it or not. Uh, you know, there's just not enough power behind the, the Supreme Court or anybody else at this point, I don't believe, to do anything about it. So uh, we're going to have a Democratic president who's an idiot, okay, and a uh, vice president who is a socialist. And, of course, she's going to be the one pulling the strings. He already refers to her as president-elect. He's done it five or six times. He doesn't even realize he's president-elect. And he talks about president-elect Kamala Harris. She's vice president-elect, you idiot. You're president-elect. Okay, but uh, he, he doesn't even know how to do that. Okay, and then we look at a Democratic uh, uh, House and the potential for a Democratic Senate, depending on, uh, or at least a, a parity uh, Senate, uh, depending on what happens in, uh, in the runoff, okay, in Georgia. Uh, uh, they could have, get both seats, in which case it will be 50-50. And then that means it's going to essentially, if everybody votes party line, it's going to come down to, guess what? Kamala Harris is the tiebreaker. So you're going to you know, have this. And so people are concerned about that. Rightly so. You should be using uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. 1 Timothy 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is to pray for your national leaders, to pray for a proper government. But the point being that you can see that God can work through governments. He brought Joseph up through a government. He took care of his people through the government. There can always be something that can happen properly through our government when you exercise prayer, when you exercise confidence in God's plan, when you don't uh, get all upset and worried and fearful and anxious. All of these things are mental attitude sins. If you stay in fellowship, have a proper mental attitude, you did your part. You voted as you should have voted. God can control what's going to happen. Jesus Christ controls history. We understand. Okay? And if the country falls apart, you'll be taken care of. Just like what happened with the Jews. Okay? So furthermore, Joseph knows that God has overruled the evil intentions of his brothers and the others to raise him to a position within the government in order to bring about <clears throat> the salvation of his people and the continuation of the covenant promise. Once again, comma, God is showing his integrity regarding his promise and that if his omnipotence is needed, To validate it, it will be used, exclamation point. And who do you think put Joseph in that spot? It was through the omnipotence of God, his power. Last sentence, we are to get our confidence from these examples, period. So the book of Exodus is not just supposed to be a history lesson. It's not just supposed to be about the creation, of, or excuse me, of Genesis. It's not supposed to be a history lesson. It's not supposed to be just the, uh, you know, just the beginning of the earth. That's where everybody stops, right, is Genesis 1.1. <laughs> the, the idea is that it's to give us the foundation. We get to see right from the very beginning the essence of God being, you know, being uh, manifest to us. We get to see uh, God's example God's confidence, or the confidence that we can develop in God. The fact that when he gives us a promise, he's going to keep the promise. The fact that uh, we can trust what he says. And then we start to see, of course, then also the formation of not only the people, but ultimately, when we get into Exodus, the, uh, the nation of Israel. Okay? And that's actually where we're going to pick it up next week, is going to be starting with the book of Exodus. <clears throat>
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to continue to study as a congregation and continue to grow, to advance in ranks, to get fantastic knowledge associated with the Old Testament and to be able to get an overview and an understanding of the messages that you have presented to us through your word. And we ask now that God the Holy Spirit would take that information that we are learning and make it understandable to us so that we can have the confidence to move forward in our daily walk with you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.